The Ministry of Defence names the 14 British servicemen killed in Afghanistan. 12 came from RAF in Los, where colleagues have been paying their tributes. They were hardworking, professional guys, uh, doing an important job, uh, which they were committed to, which they enjoyed. Al-Qaeda's second in command in Iraq is arrested. The Iraqi government says it leaves the group severely wounded. And after more than 20 years and 8 grand slams, an emotional end to the career of a tennis favourite. Hello, good, good evening. evening. The, the Ministry, Ministry of Defence has tonight released the names of the 14 British military personnel killed when their plane crashed in southern Afghanistan yesterday. Twelve of them were based at RAF in Los, where colleagues were paying their tributes. Its wing commander paid an emotional tribute to them, calling them great guys. He said that the base was in mourning and had suffered a profound loss. The investigation into the cause of the crash is continuing. From Kinloss, Andrew Castle reports. A NATO airstrike to friends and colleagues. At the Scottish Air Base, where the Nimrod crew were based, there's been a steady flow of people paying their last respects to the 12 men of 120 Squadron. RAF Kinloss is mourning its highest loss of life in more than a decade, and today senior officers describe the dead as highly skilled, hard-working professionals committed to their work. They were good friends. Their families were good friends to many of us. Many I've known uh, for a number of years, some I've known more recently. Uh, I can say no more really, they were, they were great guys. Tonight, the MOD released the names of the personnel killed in the crash. They were from the RAF, Flight Lieutenant Stephen Johnson, Lee Mitchell Moore, Gareth Nicholas, Alan Squires, and Stephen Swarbrick. Also on board, Flight Sergeants Gary Andrews, Stephen Beatty, Gerard Bell, and Adrian Davis. Also, Sergeants Benjamin Knight, John Langton, and Gary Quilliam. There were two others aboard the Nimrod. They were Lance Corporal Oliver Dickett of the Parachute Regiment and Royal Marine Joseph Windall. The Nimrod has been in service nearly 30 years and it's believed a technical problem and caused the crash. The RAF says it may be old, but it is a safe aircraft. Officially, the Nimrod fleet has not been grounded. Checks are being carried out on aircraft both here in Kinloss and also in Afghanistan. But the RAF insists that all its aircraft remain available for operational duty. Meanwhile, the sense of loss here goes well beyond the air station's perimeter fence. For more than 60 years, the RAF has brought jobs and prosperity to the Mali area. Towns like Follis are home to many of the families of service personnel based at Kinloss. When a thing like this happens, it's a shock to the system and it's a shock to the whole area is the affected. Very sad. If you were looking for 14 ladies there now without husbands or boyfriends or whatever, you know, in case of the father. As the Nimrods wait to fly again, the priority of Kid Loss is to help comfort the families of those who died. Andrew Castle, BBC News, Kid Loss. Well, after yesterday's military casualties, there are renewed questions about the nature of Britain's mission in Afghanistan and the level of resistance there. Today, the government admitted that British troops were now fighting a very bitter battle with the Taliban. Here's our defence correspondent, Paul Wood. A NATO airstrike today in southern Afghanistan. This weekend alone, NATO says it's killed some 200 Taliban fighters. Afghan army troops are supporting the offensive, which is called Operation Medusa, but British soldiers are involved as well. It's been like this all summer. The then Defence Secretary John Reid hoped Afghanistan might be done without a shot fired. He was right, said the British Minister in Kabul today. I think when John Reid said we'd love to be able to go into uh, Helmand and, and, and into Kandahar and come out with a shot being fired, he was quite right. He was expressing everyone's hope. 
Well, it's turned into a very bitter battle, and, uh, and, and it's one we've got to win. I don't think anybody was misled. How is this new Afghan war being fought? Earlier this year, military commanders admitted the Taliban had seized the initiative. They threatened or actually seized towns like Panjway in the Canadian sector and Sangin, Musakala and Nazad in the British sector. Now, in a huge offensive, NATO is fighting back, pushing the Taliban away from these towns up into the hills. The rules of engagement for the British soldiers haven't changed, but the sources tell us they are being interpreted much more aggressively to carry out preemptive attacks on Taliban bases. So Britain is reinforcing Afghanistan, but some question whether the mission can succeed and the troops are fighting the Taliban while trying to eradicate opium, the main source of income here. The Foreign Officer part of this problem, they need to have to decide what it is we wish to achieve in Afghanistan. What is our war aims? Then they've got to give that to the military, and then the military have to come back and realistically tell them what it's going to cost and what sort of kit they need to meet those war aims. At the moment, it's all muddled. The Nimrod was part of an ongoing effort against the Taliban. NATO commanders warned there'll be many more months of this intense combat. And Paul is with me. What's your assessment, Paul, of, of where this mission is in Afghanistan? Well, it has been a dreadful weekend for the British and other NATO casualties, but despite that, NATO commanders do believe they're winning, and that's because far more Taliban fighters are being killed. 200 this weekend, as many as 1,000 over the summer. That's because of NATO's superior firepower and because the Taliban are quite reckless, committing themselves to exposed positions where they can be more easily targeted. But here's the problem. Despite this imbalance, the Taliban seems still to be able to move around at will in the south, striking fear into the local population. A man was hanged only yesterday in Helman, accused of collaboration with the coalition forces. So essentially we're talking about a battle for hearts and minds here. The coalition has got to convince people they have nothing to fear from the Taliban. And the British general who commands NATO believes that the next six months he will be able to demonstrate by means of military victories like we've seen over this weekend that the uh, Afghan government has chosen the winning side. Forward, thank you. The authorities in Baghdad say Al-Qaeda's organisation in Iraq has been severely wounded by the arrest of its second in command. Hamad al-Saidi was detained a few days ago by the security forces. The Iraqi government says 20 Al-Qaeda terrorists have been killed or captured since his arrest. From Baghdad, David Lawing reports. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a rare enough moment in Baghdad, the National Security Advisor with news of a military success. After an Iraqi-led raid with American support, Hamad al-Saidi, thought to be the second in command of al-Qaeda in Iraq, was taken alive. They are suffering now. I can say that al-Qaeda in Iraq have been very seriously wounded. Hamad al-Sayyidi, also known as Abu Hamam and Abu Rana, is the most senior Iraqi in an organization headed by foreign fanatics. Al-Sayyidi is thought to be the mastermind of the bombing of the Samara Mosque. The destruction of the Golden Dome at Samara in February caused anguish to Iraqis of all faiths and sparked off a cycle of sectarian violence which has not stopped. Al-Qaeda are Sunni, and appear to want to provoke a sheer backlash. There is more talk of civil war. And the violence continued even after the death of the leader of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, Abu Musab al-Zakawi, in June. So will al-Saidi's arrest change anything? We know that al-Qaeda is a multi-headed monster. When you cut one head, you know, that part uh, emerge. So uh, al-Qaeda received a lot of severe blows before and it didn't affect it that much. With al-Saidi, the Iraqi authorities found a list of potential targets and as well as this intelligence harvest, they found enough information to arrest or kill 20 other al-Qaeda suspects this week. But even an American spokesman conceded that this would not stop al-Qaeda. David Loyne, BBC News, Baghdad.
Anti-terrorism officers have been searching 17 addresses in and around London following the arrest of 14 people in raids on Friday night. They also continued their search of a large Islamic school in East Sussex. No one has been arrested, but detectives have confirmed that a lake in the school grounds will be searched and the investigation could continue for weeks. Now, he's encouraging French children to speak more English and wants a free market cure for the country's economic woes. France's interior minister, Nicolas Sarkozy, has been setting out his campaign to succeed Jacques Chirac and become the next right-wing presidential candidate. From Marseille, Caroline Wyatt reports. No doubt it's the star of this show, Nicolas Sarkozy the man who makes no secret of his desire to rule France. What the party leader lacks in height, he makes up for in political ambition. And today he was rallying his troops and French conservatives with an almost Thatcherite call to arms. I want to replace the idea of wealth redistribution with that of wealth creation, because you have to create the wealth before you can share it. It's a free market vision that sells. Sarkozy's latest book, Testimony, has left off the shelves, outlining his plans to regenerate the creaky French economy and create new jobs. His son of an immigrant dare say the unsayable, and the young of this conference love him for it. Nicolas Sarkozy has been signing his book for almost an hour, and the queue here shows no signs of diminishing. Because the kind of he inspires among his young supporters is more like that of a rock star. The welcome, the welcome of his main, main rival, rival on the right, right French ambassador to Dominique Vivian, was rather more subdued, suggesting that despite their, their display of unity at the conference, Mr. Sarkozy can get, get party's nomination, nomination as presidential candidate at early next year. year. Yet, Yet out, out in the suburbs of Marseille, these youngsters, youngsters aren't, aren't sure who to believe, believe in. They didn't, they didn't like Mr. Sarkozy's tune during the riots, riots last, last year, year, nor his, his harsh, harsh stance on immigration. immigration. Right, tells me she doesn't defend the rioters, but she understands how they felt, trapped in these tough city estates with little hope of a better life. She says they feel imprisoned by poverty in a France that doesn't care. Instead, France's voters could put their faith in a woman with a very, very different view of the country's future, Céline Royale, a rising star of the French socialists, fighting her own campaign to be nominated by the left. The vision for the nation is a kind of gentle one that reaches out the dispossessed, which many, many here find more seductive than the free market rhetoric of the French right. Caroline Wyatt, BBC News, Marseille. The first European mission to the moon has ended with the unmanned spacecraft crashing deliberately onto the lunar surface. The orbiter crash landed at more than 4,000 miles an hour and scientists are hoping that clouds of dust created will provide vital clues about the makeup of the moon's surface. Now, news of, of an, an emotional, emotional retirement of Andre Agassi and all the sport he has brought on it. Hello again, 36-year-old Andre Agassi has finally called time on a career which took him from a rebellious teenager to a highly admired member of the tennis establishment and winner of eight Grand Slam events. So with tears, as he confirmed the retirement he'd always intended once his US Open was over, he'd been beaten by the German qualifier Benjamin Becker. Here's Daniel Larell. It was over, and it was unbearable for him. Andre Agassi's tennis career at an end. There were signs of the Agassi of old. Just not enough of them. Not even the partisan crowd could lift him in a time. He knew the end was about to come. There was, there was a standing ovation in defeat and a tearful thank you. You have given me the assurance to stand on, to reach for my dreams, dreams that could never be without you. Over the last 21 years, I have found you, and I will thank you and the memory of you with me for the rest of my life. Thank you. Unconventional and often unkempt, even at Wimbledon, he became, became one of the most popular champions of his generation and one, one of only five, five men to win all four Grand Slam titles. 
But his wife, Steffi Graf, Graf and his children, and the focus on Andre Agassi is now on family. But to today, a sport sometimes criticised for lacking personalities, said farewell to one of its greatest showmen. Daniel Arafi, BBC News. Well, meanwhile, well, Britain's Andy Murray is fighting to stay in the US Open after taking the first set against 10th seed Fernando Gonzalez from Chile. He lost the next two. The latest we have is that Murray, the 17th seed, is leading the fourth set by three games to two. Now, now Dolphin, Darren Clark and Lee West have been named, named the two wildcard picks, picks for Europe's 12-man Ryder Cup team to take on the USA in Ireland late this month. Clark, Clark an experienced Ryder Cup player, player, lost his wife Heather to, to cancer last month and hasn't, hasn't played since mid-July, but Captain Ian Woosden believes he's, he's ready to make his commitment to the intensity of the contest. They are magnificent players. Darren's had his problems in the last couple of years, but he's a magnificent player. He's got a great record in the Ryder Cup. And then and, uh, and, uh, for Lee Westwood, you know, you know he's uh, won many tournaments around the world. His, His last record in the Ryder Cup, Cup four and a half points, stands for itself. itself. Let's just take it to put down the marker for the, the new Guinness Premiership Rugby, Rugby Union season. season. Last year's runners-up beat the reigning champion, champion Sarah Sharks, Sharks in an exciting match at World Road, Road, scoring four, four tries to save two in a win by 35 points to 23. And in today's other match, Northampton beat Newcastle 25 23. That's it, Thanks very much, Rob. Now, now let's uh, find out what's, what's happening, happening with the weather. weather. John, John Hammond can tell us, John. John. Thanks, Thanks, Jay. Well, well summer, summer return, return today, today with the temperature hitting 80 degrees across parts of, of the south east of England. England. More mm, weather to come up through Monday, Monday as well. It won't be as windy, windy as it was today. today. That, that said, said, it's still pretty gusty out there at the moment, moment particularly across parts of Scotland, Scotland and Northern England. England. But despite, despite that, that, it's not feeling really cold, cold at all. Temperatures temperature somewhere, somewhere between 11 and 16 degrees. degrees. A dry start, start the new working, working week for most of us with, with some no good spells of sunshine across more central, central and eastern areas. Out west, west though, changes on the way, way the clouds thickening, thickening up with, with some rain arriving. We'll get into some detail through mid-afternoon, starting, starting off across the southwest of England. Here, here it will turn increasingly damp and drizzly, and drizzly I think. Quite misty and murky around exposed coast and hills too. And this dampness pushing northwards into parts of Wales and eventually some fairly heavy rain turning up across Snowdonia. That rain knocks you on the door of County down, down by, by 4 in the afternoon, afternoon but for most, most of all now it'll be dry for much of the day. Scotland too, bright and breezy, still, still some showers across, across the far north, but that gusty wind, wind gradually subsiding, 18 degrees in Glasgow should feel quite comfortable. A fair, a fair amount, amount of high cloud at times, times pushing in across parts of northern England, England turning sunshine haze, but, but uh, still a reasonable day here. 20, 20 degrees in Birmingham, a lot of dry weather, and uh, brightness for East Anglia in the south east, and 24 degrees in London will feel very pleasant indeed. indeed. More warm sunshine, sunshine to come over the next couple of days, days across southern areas, areas but for Scotland and Northern Ireland, Ireland some, some rain, rain on that quite heavy too. Jane, back to you. John, John thank, thank you very much. much. And that, and that is it from, from Rob, Rob and from me for this evening. There's news throughout the night over on BBC News 24. But from, from us, a very, very good night. Bye-bye.